Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we will be doing the first novel in Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos, the novel Hyperion. It was published in 1989. To learn more about the universe in which this series takes place, take a look at my Hyperion Cantos universe video. There will be a link to it in the upper right corner or you can go to the end of the video where there will be a link to the playlist that will contain all of the series. Before we begin, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and now Hyperion. The Consul was on an unnamed planet. He was there for some rest and relaxation. He was the only sentient being on the planet. His idea of relaxation was to hunt some of the big game in the fern forests of that planet. He was just playing Ramanov's prelude in C sharp minor on a Steinway when he received a fat line message. It was from Mayna Gladstone, the CEO of the Hegemony Senate. She told him that he had been chosen to return to Hyperion as a member of the Strike Pilgrimage. He and six others had been chosen by the Church of the Shrike and confirmed by the All Thing, and she told him that it was an the interest of the hegemony that he accept. She goes on to tell him that the consulate and the home rule council of Hyperion had fat lined them three weeks ago with the news that the time tombs showed signs of opening, that the anti-entropic fields around them were expanding rapidly and the Shrike had begun to range as far south as the Brittle Range. She said that a space task force was dispatched from Parvati to evacuate the hegemony citizens from Hyperion before the time tombs opened. And the task force time depth is three Hyperion years. Meanwhile, there is an ouster migration cluster of at least 4,000 units that has been detected approaching the Hyperion system. They believe that the evacuation task force should arrive only a short while before the ousters. They also believe that this is the ouster's big push. They're not sure if they're going to Hyperion to take control of the time tombs or whether this is an all-out attack on the world web. So they are sending a space battle fleet that is complete with far-caster construction battleton from the CAM system to join the evacuation task force. But the fleet may be recalled depending on the circumstances. The Templars are sending their tree ship Yggdrasil to pick him up and he is to rendezvous and join it at the Pravati system and the six other pilgrims will be on the ship and she says that their intelligence suggests that one of the seven pilgrims is an agent of the ousters and they don't know which one. She goes on to tell him that Saul Weinfarb and Fedman Kassad will be among the seven pilgrims that were chosen. She finished by saying that we need your help. It is essential that the secrets of the time tombs and the shrike be uncovered, that this pilgrimage may be their last chance. If the ousters conquer Hyperion, their agent must be eliminated and the time tombs sealed at all costs. The fate of the hegemony may depend on it. And although he didn't want to go back to Hyperion, the next morning his spaceship took off for the rendezvous point. When the consul woke up, from cryogenic fugue, he was told that the tree was two light minutes and five hours travel away from Hyperion. He was met by Het Mastin, who was the captain of the Templar tree ship and the true voice of the tree. Mastin told him that the others have been awake for some hours and they are assembled on the foremost dining platform. And after he had dressed, proceeded to take him there. While they were on their way, Mastin told him that his ship has been fueled and is waiting in Sphere 11 and that the other pilgrims have agreed to be ferried down in his ship. He also informed him that the tree ship was being escorted by a hegemony warship. Those six was the tree ship's only passengers. Once they were seated at the dining table, Mastin introduced the other pilgrims. There was Father Lenar Hoyt, a Catholic priest that seems to be in his early 30s, who seemed to have had a very hard life because something aged him. Next was Colonel Fedman Kassad. 
the butcher of Salbrescia. Then there was the poet Martin Salinas. He was short and out of shape. Next was Saul Weinthorab, who was a well-known scholar called the Wandering Jew, and with him in his hands he held his daughter Rachel, who was an infant. The sixth pilgrim and the only woman was Brani Lamia, and she was a detective, and she was from the 1.3G world of Lucius. The consul asked Hetmastine who the seventh pilgrim was, and Mastin replied that he is the seventh. They then discussed how far away the ousters were. They were told that they were in the earth cloud, and they discussed whether there was going to be a war, and the answer to that, nobody knew. When they were told that they would take the consul's ship down and land at Keats, which is the only spaceport on the planet, and from there it would take several days to reach the time tombs, they wanted to know why they couldn't just go straight to the time tombs. They were informed that while spacecraft and aircraft can go and land at the time tombs and their computers and program can bring them back, but all of the pilots and the passengers who are on those ships when they go to the time tombs disappear. No one knows what happens to them. Those ships' logs show nothing, no violence, no forced entry, no deviation from course, no unexplained time lapses, no unusual energy emissions or deletions, no physical phenomena of any sort, just that the people are gone. Then, Saul Weintraub had an idea that since no one knows why the Shrike Church and the All Thing chose them to go on this voyage, he suggested that they share their stories in the next few days. It's a mystery, and maybe by telling their stories, they'll be able to figure out this mystery. Then Brani asked, what's to keep us from lying? And Martin says, nothing. That's the beauty of it. They decided to put it to a vote, and they decided that they will abide by the majority. Saul, Het, Martin, and the consul all voted yes. Father Hoyt and Brani voted no, and Fedman Kassad abstained. Then Martin recorded numbers 1 through 7 and put them on strips of paper. They drew lots and decided in what order they would go. When the consul looked at his little strip of paper, he was number 7, which pleased him because it meant that anything could happen before he had to tell his story. Father Hoyt was first. He left and got two small notebooks and came back. He then told them that in order to tell his tale, he had to tell someone else's story as well. These journals belong to a man who was the reason for my coming to Hyperion and why I'm returning today. Father Lenar Hoyt began his story. He was born, raised, and ordained on the Catholic world of Passim. And his first off-world assignment, he was ordered to escort Jesuit Father Paul Dure into exile on the world of Hyperion. Paul Dure was an archaeologist an ethnologist and a Jesuit theologian. Something had happened to him when he was in the world of Amagast, and when he returned, there were whispers that he was almost excommunicated and even had a hearing before the Holy Office of the Inquisition. But instead, he asked to be posted to Hyperion, and Father Hoyt had been chosen to escort him there. He was under orders to see that Father Dure went down to the Hyperion spaceport, then Father Hoyt was to reboard and head back to the world web. And Father Hoyt wasn't too happy about it because he would have had a time depth of eight years and he would be eight years behind his former classmates. By the time they got there, Father Dure had told him what he was planning to do. He was planning to do research on the Bikura. Father Hoyt thought that the Bikura were legend, but he was pointed to a note by Mamet Spedlin, who had encountered them almost a century and a half earlier. Father Hoyt did not understand why Father Dure wanted to go there, because as he said, if they are extinct as a group, then all of your time, debt, and labor, and pain of getting there will be for nothing. And all Father Dure said was precisely. So Father Hoyt escorted Father Dure all the way down to the spaceport, and then turned around and headed back to Passam. When he had gotten back to Passam, the bishop told him that they haven't heard anything from Paul Dure during the four years that he was in Hyperion, and that the New Vatican had spent a fortune on fat line inquiries, but neither the colonial 
authorities, nor the consulate in Keats, were able to locate the missing priest. That's when the consul added that he remembers the case. His seal, his aide, was trying to solve the problem of the missing cleric. But except for a few reports of sightings in Port Romance, they never found a trace of him. Hoyt went on to say that he had gone back to Hyperion to find Father Duray, and by the time he was ready to return to the web, he had discovered the fate of Father Duray. And he goes on to tell the group that if he's to complete this, he must read excerpts from the two notebooks he has. He begins his journal by trying to figure out how he's going to date it, and finally decided he would call it day one of his exile. He goes on to say that he feels exhausted, although he was asleep for months. He feels bad about not getting to know young Hoyt better. He seems to be a decent fellow, but he said it was no fault of youngsters like him that the church is in its final days, and that his brand of happy naivety can do nothing to arrest the slide into oblivion which the church seems destined for. He goes on to describe his first view of Hyperion. He had scheduled to stay a month in Keats, and he plans to take a tour of Keats the next day. While he was wandering around on the banks of the Huli River near Jacktown, he found a cathedral, an abandoned one. It looked like it was abandoned at least two centuries ago. As he was wandering through the ruins, he remembers that the Bishorik, on passing, did not mention any history of Catholicism on Hyperion, not even the presence of a cathedral. He found the great cross that had hung behind the altar that had fallen and now lay in splinters, and without thinking about it, he raised his hands and began the celebration of Eucharist. He was startled to see an old woman in the fourth pew in a black dress. He noticed that she was blind when she looked towards him, and he called to her, but she got up and left. He tried to follow her, but he lost her. For a second, he would have thought that he imagined her, except for a lone red candle whose tiny flame was flickering where she was sitting. He finally told himself he was tired of Keats and wanted to leave, so tomorrow he planned to head south. On this day, they were offloading passengers and freight at Felix, which is a major city on an island called Katki in the Middle Sea. He didn't think there were more than 5,000 people living there. Next, the ship was going to go 800 kilometers down a series of smaller islands called the Nine Tails, and then it would go across 700 kilometers of open sea and the equator. After that, they should hit the northwest coast of Aquila. He spent some time being annoyed at the animals that he keeps running into. He had dinner with citizen Herimus Danzel on the promenade deck. He was a professor from a small planter's college near Endominion. He was retired, and he told Paul that the official names of the three continents was Crichton, Allenson, and Lopez. It was in honor of three middle-level bureaucrats in the old service service. They were in a dirigible that was 300 meters above the sea. He was thinking of his sin at falsifying evidence on Amagast. It seems he had falsified the evidence to indicate that there was a Christ-oriented culture 600 light years from old earth, almost 3,000 years before man left the surface of the home world. He did it because he was trying to find a way to re-engineer a resurgence of Christianity in their lifetime. He did it because he thinks the church is dying. He has been in Port Romance for eight days, and he has already seen three dead men. The first was a bloated corpse that washed up on the mud flats. Children were throwing stones at it. The second was a man who had burnt to death in a methane unit shop in the poor section of town near his hotel. His body was shod beyond recognition, and he felt shame because the smell of the burnt flesh made him hungry. And the third man was murdered about three meters from him. He had just emerged from the hotel when shots rang out. He had been shot three times. Two bullets went into his chest. The third entered below his left eye. He was still breathing, when he reached him, and without thinking, he began to perform the sacrament of extreme unction. The man died, and he stayed with the body for the rest of the day. The doctor allowed him to stay during the required autopsy. As the doctor was performing the autopsy, he said this is what the whole thing is worth. When Paul asked him what thing, he said his life. 
your life, my life. Paul replied, there has to be more than this. The doctor says, is there? Please show me. The doctor pulled out his heart and said, in the web world, this is worth some money on the open market. For those too poor to keep vat-grown clone parts on store, but too well off to die just for the want of a heart. No suspect was ever found. No motive was ever put forward. The man was buried the next day. There was a riverboat departing up the cans in two days. He booked passage and will move his trunks onto it tomorrow. It will not be hard to leave Port Romance behind. There have been no sign of human habitation since they left Melton's Landing two days ago and the emperatic Girondole was slowly going upriver. He was sitting on a tin roof trying to get his first glimpse of a Tesla tree. But old Caddy was laughing at him saying there isn't any flame trees down this far. If there were, the forest would look the way it does. He continued, you've got to get up in the pinions before you see a Tesla. We ain't out of the rainforest yet and every afternoon it pours. It rains so hard that with a river that's only 40 meters wide, you can't see the shore. Old Caddy keeps telling him that he's come too late to climb through the rain and the flame forest before the Tesla trees become active. Later, after the rain, he lay on top the roof of his barge watching the meteors go by. He arrives at the Perisilva plantation sick. He is very sick with a fever, lots of shaking, and vomiting black bile. A woman is taking care of him. She bathes him and he's too sick to be ashamed. She doesn't say much and she has dark gentle eyes and he's sad to be sick so far from home. He begins to hallucinate he is so sick. He thinks the women are trying to seduce him. He thinks they are bathing him in poison. He thinks he's been shot through the cheek and when he finds the bullet he'll spit it out. On day 65 he thanks God for deliverance from his illness. On day 66, he was able to shave and take a shower, and Semfa helped him prepare for the administrator's visit. He was concerned of having to pay for his medical care, but the administrator was very helpful. He told him there would be no charge, and he would assign a man to lead him into the high country. He says it's late in the season, but if I can travel in 10 days, we should be able to make it through the flame forest to the cleft before the Tesla trees are fully active. Then he spoke to Semfer for a while. Her husband died here three local months ago in a harvesting accident, and she had come from Port Romance. Her marriage was a salvation to her, and she chose not to go back, instead to stay here doing odd jobs, and he will be ready in 10 days. Before leaving with his guide, Tuck, he went down to the parties to see and say goodbye to Semfer. He could tell her she was sad to see him go. So he blessed her and kissed her on the forehead. Then, as they were heading off with two pack brides, Supervisor Orlandi came to the end of the road and waved as they entered into the foliage. After two weeks of traveling through the forest and climbing up the steep shoulder of the Pinion Plateau, they emerged onto a rocky outcropping that gave them a view looking back across the jungle towards the beak and the middle sea. The plateau was almost 3,000 meters above sea level and it had a great view. It continued onward and upward late into the evening. Tuck was obviously worried that they would be caught in the flame forest. When the Tesla trees become active and he was struggling to keep up, tugging at his heavily laden bread and saying silent prayers to keep his mind off his aches and pains and misgivings. They were up and loaded and moving before dawn with the air smelling of smoke and ash. There was a change in the vegetation on the plateau. And it was late in the afternoon when they saw their first Tesla tree. It was still about half a kilometer away and it was at least a hundred meters tall. Near its crown it bulged with the distinctive onion-shaped dome of its accumulator gall. And above the gall was radial branches that trailed dozens of nimbus vines, each looking silver and metallic. Tuck insisted that they get out of here and that they change into their flame forest gear right then and there. So they put on their osmosis mask and thick rubber sole boots and layers of leathery gamma cloth. He could smell the ozone even through his mask and both of the brids were acting nervous. They camped for the night 
as close to a bestest break as they could, and Tuck showed him how to set up a ring of arrestor rods all the time. He was saying dire warnings to himself while searching the evening sky for clouds. And Paul intended to sleep well tonight, despite everything. We will stop here and continue in a future video. I want to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.